this is Gilbert Gottfried, and I want to announce there is new morning show, or their new morning show, online. It's a show called Wake and Bake with Captain Hooter. Ah, that gives you cannabis news, reviews, and interviews. And, um... And I don't know what news on cannabis is. Uh, uh, like, I was smoking some cannabis, then I looked at my hand, and I started laughing, and then I ate 5,000 peanut butter cups, and then I looked over at a chair and thought it was running after me, and I, and I freaked out. Anyway, listen to... Captain Hooter on Wake and Bake. It's Captain Hooter. Hello. Dzień dobry. Bon dia. Dobre jutro. Dobre jutro. I tu jest Arsyl Zednan. Good morning. Good morning. Morning. Oh, hey, what's happening, everybody? Welcome back to the Hooterverse. Just getting ready to take a big bong hit, but I wanted to let you know that today we are only going to be doing an interview because this is a long interview with one of my favorite cannabis advocates of all time, Dana Larson. Dude, this guy is absolutely incredible. He's got his fingers and pots all over the place. And you are about to learn a great deal about what's really going on in Canada. So sit back, spark up your bong, grab a cup of coffee, and enjoy this interview with Dana Larson. Good morning, everyone. Captain Hooter here, high and alive once again. And I'm here with a legendary cannabis activist, a leader, innovator, a fighter, warrior, a fight the power, Master, Mr. Dana Larson from Vancouver, Canada. How are you, sir? Hey, thanks for having me. I'm doing great. Today's my birthday, actually, so you got me on a great day. Good. Happy birthday. Cheers. Well done, sir. 29 again. Huh? Awesome. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I had a friend of mine that said that every year. He says, I'm 29 again this year. So it's fantastic. So normally, this time of year, uh, there would be no chance whatsoever that I'd be able to talk to you because uh, you would be uh, buried doing the 420 uh, ceremonies that you've been doing for so many years. Uh, uh, this year, again, I guess, I guess you guys uh, decided to call it off. Uh, last year, you did a virtual 420, correct? Yeah, well, we, we, you know, we, the last, the last big one was uh, 2019. That was the 25th anniversary. We had Cypress Hill come out. We had like a quarter million people on the, the park at uh, Sunset Beach in Vancouver. It was the biggest and greatest 420 the city's ever seen. But with COVID coming, it was hard to put on events the last couple of years. And, you know, we normally start organizing it several months in advance. And like November or December of the year before, we're getting to work on 420. And for this one, we just didn't know what the world was going to be like uh, in November and December and whether we'd be able to put on a large event. So we decided to not, <clears throat> not have the event this year. Another group is doing something smaller at the Vancouver Art Gallery, which is the former home of our 420 until it got too big. And they have my blessings. I hope they do well. And next year, who knows what will happen? It's too early to say. But, uh, you know, 420 was and is a great event was also a ton of work. It cost a lot of money. It was a big challenge to put it on every year and it kept growing bigger and bigger. So, you know, we'll see what happens next year. But uh, this year it is kind of nice not to have to be worrying about that and to be able to focus on other things. I was going to say, you look a lot more relaxed. 
uh, than uh, the last time I saw you uh, in the planning stages of the 420. It's uh, it definitely is a chaotic uh, experience. Now, the last time that I actually saw you face to face was uh, in 2018 at Cannabis Liberation Day in Amsterdam. And uh, I right. had just finished... I had just finished writing my book, the, the Connoisseur's Guide to the Amsterdam Coffee Shops, and I was doing the Cannabis Education Day seminars, and you were one of the featured speakers. And uh, the time that I had seen you before that was when I was living in Canada. I lived in uh, uh, Victoria, BC, Canada, and I had seen you because I came after your, your uh, comic books your uh, Harry Pothead books and uh, Green Eggs and Hash. And i that's what I knew you from. And then the next thing I knew, you were this, had evolved into this major uh, uh, a player. And, and then of course, uh, well, listen, there's some, I have a lot of people in Europe and I have a lot of people in the United States that may not really know your whole story. Uh, can you give me the 32nd uh, Dana Larson uh, elevator speech, if you were going to tell us who Dana Larson is. Well, it might take more than 30 seconds, but I mean, I'm turning, <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I'm turning 51 today, and I've been working to end the war on drugs one way or another since I was about 18. I started smoking pot in high school. I read The Emperor Wears No Clothes, the classic Jack Herrera book that was really the first book to get into the whole hemp and marijuana conspiracy and the hidden history of cannabis. <clears throat> I started a club at my university called the League for Ethical Action on Drugs in like the late 80s and early 90s. After I graduated, I started working uh, with Mark Emery. I did Cannabis Culture, Cannabis Canada magazine became Cannabis Culture magazine. I did that for 10 years. I helped create the Canadian Marijuana Party in 2000 and then the BC Marijuana Party in 2001. Uh, in 2006, I opened the Vancouver Seed Bank. A couple of years later, I opened uh, Vancouver's third cannabis dispensary, the medicinal cannabis dispensary, really the first one to use the word dispensary and not compassion club. We really were active in teaching others how to open their own dispensaries and help build the dispensary movement across Canada. Uh, I was involved and still am involved in the New Democratic Party. It's Canada's uh, left-leaning party. I ran as a candidate for them in 2008. That didn't go so well, though. I had to resign. Um, under pressure from being a cannabis user and psychedelic user and stuff. But I ran again for the leadership of the British Columbia New Democrats in 2010. And I didn't win, but it was a good race and helped to, to bring forward the ideas that I promote to, to the NDP. Uh, and um, 2013, I launched a campaign called Sensible BC that was a, a signature gathering effort in British Columbia to try to force uh, decriminalization at the provincial level and although we didn't get enough signatures it's very very difficult we would have qualified in any u.s state but in british columbia it's extremely difficult to get something on the ballot but it was during that campaign that trudeau announced his support for legalization and when he became prime minister he followed through and legalized cannabis we have some complaints about how it was legalized but the reality is there's 60,000 less arrests every year for cannabis possession now and canadians can buy cannabis and hundreds of legal shops across the country, which is all good. <clears throat> and then uh, last year I opened, or I guess in 2020, I opened the, the medicinal mushroom dispensary and also the Coca Leaf Cafe. And we've now got, we got a storefront in Vancouver and we are uh, selling a lot of mushroom, magic mushroom products, the psilocybin mushrooms, all different strains and chocolates and micro doses in person and by mail. And our storefront is really unique on the planet earth. There's nowhere else you can go into not only do we sell magic mushrooms, we also sell coca leaf, which is the leaf that's known for making cocaine out of it, but it's also been chewed and used as a, a tea and a natural medicine for thousands of years across South America. We also sell LSD microdoses. We sell peyote and San Pedro cactus and things like that. We also sell uh, kratom, a herb not many people have heard about really yet, but it's a, it's a wonderful substitute for opiates. And uh, it's like a leaf from a tree that grows in Southeast Asia. And um, so I've got a lot of things going on, a lot of irons in the fire, but uh, we're really uh, transforming Vancouver right now. There's a lot of new mushroom dispensaries opening up and I've become kind of the spokesperson for the mushroom dispensary movement in Vancouver. And uh, that brings us to today. Yeah, so you've just been sitting around on your hands doing nothing. 
<laughs> yeah, I guess so. I mean, it's uh, it's been a great 30, you know, 30, 40 yeah. years, real 30 years or so working on these things. And we made a lot you, of progress. You left out a couple of things. Probably, you yeah. You left out a couple of things. Yeah, you know, well, yeah, yeah, well, well let's, let's, you know, it's funny because the, the other day somebody asked me who you were and I go, well, he's like uh, the guy who gave out 10 million seeds. Mm-hmm. And he went, what? Yeah. <laughs> that was the overgrown Canada. That was actually the only time I'd been arrested and been to jail for my activism. We, we launched in 2016. I had access to a large quantity of cannabis seeds. It was a, like a low THC, high CBD variety. We didn't have some THC seeds too in the first year, but I gave out, uh, I went on a national tour. I announced I was going to give away seeds by mail. We, I went on a national tour uh, to talk about cannabis history of, of Canada and to give away seeds. And at my second stop <clears throat> in the city of Calgary, I was arrested along with one of our volunteers and spent the night in jail for giving away cannabis seeds. <clears throat> and although that sounds rough, it actually really helped the campaign because I got publicity. international media. I got tons of publicity out of it, international media attention. Mm -hmm. I was trending on like Twitter and Facebook and stuff for the day. And uh, we, I bet first year I was trying to give away 1 million seeds. We ended up doing 2 million seeds. And, um, and eventually I went to trial the next year uh, for that giveaway. And they just ended up dismissing all the charges and nothing really happened. But um, but I was able to give away 10 million seeds over four years. I think it's the most people receiving seeds in the biggest kind of way like that ever in human history, as far as I know. And we had seeds and I think, of plants yeah. growing. We had plants. It was called Overgrow Canada. And the idea was to plant cannabis in public places, uh, you know, parks and schools and community traffic circles and anywhere just to have it growing openly like any other plant like it should be you know seeing a live cannabis plant really should be no more shocking than seeing a live oak tree or a daffodil or whatever it's a natural plant and it's you know obviously you see a cannabis plant growing wild now it's kind of a big surprise but we had plants showing up in parks and in traffic circles and in front of city hall in front of police stations and all across the country and uh ultimately I, I stopped doing the campaign in 2019 it was a huge effort we had dozens of volunteers coming to my house and for days and days or, you know you have to organize thousands and thousands of seeds to be mailed out yeah. and sorted and labeled and shipped and it was a massive volunteer effort uh, a lot of hours went into that every year and i'm really proud it's one of the things i forgot to mention it there's probably other things i've forgotten to mention too there's a lot of different projects and activities over the years but that was a, that was a good one thanks for bringing it up yeah well you know it, it, there's like buzz points you know and it, and it's the, like the first one that comes to my head he goes he's the dude that gave away 10 million seats um and and i believe uh, high times magazine uh rated that or or awarded you an award for having that being one of the the greatest all-time marijuana stuff top, right top 10 for. list or yeah i don't know i mean it was the, yeah but that was nice to be recognized that way and um yeah, it was a very successful campaign, uh, but ultimately, yeah, we people still ask me now, you still giving away seeds? And I got to be like, well, no, we, after four years, we stopped doing that, but uh, these things can't go on forever. But now you're giving away magic mushrooms. Oh, yeah, well, mostly I'm selling them, but I do give them away sometimes as well. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, we're making those accessible to people. And it's really wonderful to see the response that we get, especially microdosing. I think microdosing is is going to be huge. I mean, I'm all for macro dosing. I think it's very beneficial to have the larger dosages, but I think we're going to see micro dosing becoming like the CBD of mushrooms. And there's many people who could probably benefit from a, a, a marijuana high or from THC, but they're not, they're afraid or they're not into that, but they'll take CBD. And I think there'll be many people who are micro dosing who, for whatever reason, don't want to do larger dosages, but you can get a lot of benefits from micro dosing. It's really uh, a lot of people I know who are on antidepressants are working to get off of them or have stopped taking them and are using microdosing instead for much better results. And this, I think, is the, is the future is going to be uh, microdosing and psychedelic therapy is going to be huge. We're just scratching the surface right now. Absolutely. And now you're the very first microdosing dispensary, right? There, that, you're the first. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm, I'm not the first guy to sell mushrooms over the Internet by any means in Canada, but I was the first person to put my name on it to do it openly and transparently and to uh, sort of be, be blatant about it. And same with my mushroom dispensary, our storefront, you know, there's probably at least seven or eight places in Vancouver now that are also selling mushrooms and microdoses and things. 
<clears throat> but none of them will go on the news or talk to the media or be out there about it. So I've become sort of the de facto spokesperson for this because I'm happy to go on camera and talk about the benefits of mushrooms. And, you know, it draws, it draws attention, sometimes negative attention from the city and from authorities. But I also think people go, well, look, Dane is doing it and nothing's happened to him. So maybe I can do it too. And that's what I want. I love to see this movement growing. We did very similar things with, with can cannabis dispensary. I wasn't the first guy to open a cannabis dispensary. Many of them had been open for quite a few years, but there was only a really small handful in Canada when I opened mine. And I built on the shoulders of those who had gone before me. But what we did differently is we were very open about it. I was in the media a lot and we strongly encouraged others to follow our model and kind of taught people how to open their own cannabis dispensaries. And as a result, the first five or six that opened in Vancouver after me all got free guidance and advice and help from us to get open. And of course, in some ways we're creating our own competition and everything, but I don't really see it like that. I just want to see a strong movement of these places across the country. And I don't believe that marijuana would have been legalized in Canada if we hadn't have had already hundreds of shops defying the law and openly selling it. I think that yeah. wasn't the only ingredient, but it was a necessary precursor to legalization. You've got to normalize first, the law changes after. People think, well, the law changes, then it gets normalized. No, no, no. You normalize first, you create what you want, and the law will follow. And so I think we're going to see the same thing with mushroom dispensaries and psychedelics, <clears throat> not just in Vancouver, but all across Canada. We're going to see more and more places opening, and some, some jurisdictions will attack them, some jurisdictions will allow them and support them, but ultimately, within a few years, there's going to be hundreds of places across Canada selling mushrooms and other psychedelics. And I think that that is going to help lead us to proper legalization where any adult can go in and buy these kind of products. And in some way, mushrooms are less controversial than cannabis. You know, the biggest issue around cannabis really is the smoke. And so many people are triggered and hate marijuana smoke. And don't, of course, I think marijuana smoke is wonderful. It's a beautiful incense. And I enjoy smelling when I walk down the street. But, but the yeah. idea of smoking <clears throat> definitely makes it challenging. And mushrooms don't have that challenge. So maybe in some ways, mushroom legalization will be easier to get to than, than cannabis legalization was. Oh, absolutely. And, and again, you're, 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 you sound almost, I, earlier today, I was interviewing uh, Renus uh, Bintama. You know him from Suver Nuver, uh, the, uh, the organization that was uh, giving away free cannabis oil to patients in, uh, in the Netherlands. And there, of course, cannabis oil is treated just like if it was heroin. And he went to great uh, risk to his, his freedom. And he's, he's went down the same road that you did getting arrested. And, you know, he basically saying, I don't care what the laws are. The laws are going to change around me. And eventually he built up a, 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 a following of patients of 30,000 patients and, uh, ended up going to trial in November of last year, uh, was found guilty, but they gave him no punishment. Uh, but his punishment was that he couldn't make the oils anymore. So now he's made a new derivative using water and uh, using the process of where the cannabinoids can be kind of hidden in a Trojan horse inside the water molecules. And so you can get actually more of it. And he's found a loophole in the laws. Uh, so that basically Sounds he's following like the same guy. rules. Yeah, oh God, he's the best. You're, yeah, and I was gonna say, I should put the two of you together because you're both fine. That, that's why I put you on the same weekend. And you and, and Renus are two guys that I've seen that have been going right into the fire and saying, listen, this is wrong. I know it's wrong. Everybody knows it's wrong. We're going to change it. And you've done that. And it's, it, it's been so impressive. And I mean, the, the other difference and interesting part about you is the fact that you've really made serious attempts to go after this from different angles, not just from the civil dis disobedience side, but you've tried to get into the political system and tried to change things. And ultimately, it was a lot of the wars and battles that you fought that helped to change things with the Trudeau um, uh, uh, party coming in. Now, here's my question. All around the world, people are now looking to Canada as being a blueprint for what a legalized cannabis society looks like when it's done correctly. On a scale of one to 10, what would you rate the legalization of cannabis in Canada right now? And what needs to change? What would you change? Well, those are difficult. Rating it on a scale <clears throat> is difficult. I mean, if you compare it to what I ideally would like to see, 
we're still a long way from that. You know, there's lots of flaws in legalization. There's still treating cannabis much more strictly than alcohol, the penalties for cannabis offenses working outside the legal system are still much greater than they are for anything else. So it, in many ways, it's still quite flawed. But on the other hand, Canada has the most progressive cannabis laws of any country on earth. There's American states that have got better laws at the state level, but I can't think of a federal government anywhere in the world that has more progressive laws than Canada does when it comes to cannabis. So it depends what you compare it to, right? I mean, in some ways, you know, if you look at how alcohol is treated, for instance, in Canada, there's no warning labels on alcohol. It's readily available, easily accessed, and not a lot of stigma around the use of alcohol. So all of our politicians will pose with wine and beer and talk about supporting the liquor industry. With cannabis, it's covered in warning labels in a way that alcohol is not, even though cannabis obviously is much safer. And probably cannabis should have a couple of warning labels on it, but the ones they have are really extreme and go beyond the pale. And if you're not going to warn people about alcohol, you shouldn't be warning them about cannabis. You know, and the penalties, there's a lot of areas like we're allowed to grow four cannabis plants per household in Canada, not per person, but per household. Of course, that's better than zero plants. It should be no limit or it should be a much bigger number, really. But still four is pretty good. But at the provincial level, Quebec and Manitoba said, you're not growing any cannabis in our province. So they banned it provincially. Here in British Columbia, supposedly a cannabis friendly province, they passed a law that, okay, you can grow your four plants at home, but if anybody can see those plants from a public space, so if you have it on the balcony or in a window or in your backyard, someone can see it, that's a crime. You can go to jail for three months and get thousands of dollars in fines. Well, that makes no sense at all. Why? It's a Are we stigmatizing in the being able to see cannabis? It's like the idea that seeing this plant is inherently harmful and a child might see your marijuana and who knows what could happen. So, you know, there's still a lot of flaws in this legislation, still a lot of stigma. <clears throat> so from that sense, on a scale from one to 10 compared to what it should be, I wouldn't give it a very high number, three or four. But compared to every other country on earth, I think it's a nine or a 10 because we are, you know, far more progressive on this than any other area is, right? So yeah. there's still lots to do, but there's there's still a lot of a lot of things that, that have been done. And I don't think they're going to be going back and changing the federal cannabis laws in Canada anytime soon. They've been there, they've done that, they don't want to revisit it. And, you know, it cost Trudeau a lot of political capital, a lot of effort. Some of the deals that were made might seem distasteful or annoying to us. You know, they gave the police $300 million in Canada to help them deal with the challenges of legalization. And of course, after legalization, the cops go, well, nothing really happened. We don't really see any difference. It's not really a big deal. But I think that was probably needed. You know, we were all like, oh, you're giving the cops more money. Why are you doing that? But maybe you've got to buy them off in the world of real politics to make these kind of compromises to get it through, right? So, you know, in that sense, I think sometimes the, the, the challenges in that it's easy to complain, but in the real politics, sometimes you got to make compromises to make things happen, right? So, you know, I, I, but I think definitely people around the world look at Canada and, and think, well, if they can do it there. Why can't we do this here? And that I think is very important, right? That we're not maybe have the perfect laws, but we're an inspiration to other countries. And most people don't yes. really care about all the details, right? You and I are deep into it. So all the yeah. details and the things, they matter to us. But for most people, they're happy they can go buy cannabis in a shop. They're happy they're not going to get arrested for possession. And the rest of the details aren't really so important, right? So, but we still have work to do. You know, there's no place you can legally smoke cannabis in a public place in Canada. You can't do it indoors anywhere. Most homes don't allow you to smoke cannabis. Most apartment buildings and condos don't allow you to smoke cannabis. Public parks don't allow it. So there's very few places where you can really take cannabis in that kind of way. So still a lot of work to do. And weirdly, medical marijuana in Canada is now harder to access than so-called recreational marijuana is, right? So the shops where you can go and buy marijuana in a store, they are only selling recreational cannabis is how they define it. So if you want to go in there and ask them a question, oh, well, I use marijuana for this ailment or how can I, what strain or what product can help me with the, whatever and my health issue is, about they're legally forbidden from talking to you about that. If you want medical marijuana, <clears throat> which is, of course, the exact same product made by the exact same people, you have to go to a doctor and get a prescription, and then you have to buy it by mail order from one of these companies. And the, the taxes oh, are God. still as high. There's no like, I mean, I would say at least medical cannabis should be taxed less or not have all the excise taxes on it. 
if you wanted, especially with the prescription. Other prescription drugs in Canada are tax free. They don't tax other prescription right. drugs. But marijuana, right. not only is it taxed with the GST, the sales tax, there's also an excise tax on it as well of a dollar a gram. So even if the cannabis price, and it has been dropping in Canada, you know, when I first started getting involved in buying and selling marijuana, <clears throat> The late two, in the late 2000s, like or so, it was about $2,400 Canadian for a pound of marijuana. And if you get that across the border, the price would often double. Now the price in Canada has dropped down to like five or six hundred dollars a pound wholesale, which is great, I think, for you. Not good for me. I sell marijuana for a living. So having the price go down isn't great for me, but it's good for consumers. And that's what we want, right? Legalization should have a price crash. Marijuana should be more expensive than other vegetables, but not that much, right? It should be a lot right. cheaper. Uh, and so I think that's really good. So, you know, these things will take many more years in Canada to untangle and to get better. And, you know, just like the alcohol laws, when we ended alcohol prohibition, it took decades to get a better situation with alcohol and being able to access it properly. And so cannabis will take a while. What's interesting to me is that post legalization, not a single politician in Canada, federally, provincially, or municipally has come out as a cannabis user. All these guys pose with alcohol, even politicians who don't really drink alcohol will pose with a beer. Newspapers talk about who do you wanna drink a beer with and which politician beer and wine and whatnot. But not one person has come out and said, oh, I use it's legal now and I like to smoke marijuana on occasion or I use it in the evenings or whatever. I think there's still a lot of fear and stigma that if you admit to be a cannabis user, uh, you will not be voted. For. <coughs> You'll be mocked or, or harassed. And I've smoked pot with plenty of politicians who are in power and elected and not one of them has come out and said I'm a marijuana user. Yeah. So it's interesting to me that in Canada, you know, I, I can't think of any other sort of minority group that would not be electable. I think having a gay prime minister or a gay political leader is would be fine in Canada. Most people wouldn't care. Having a person of color or different things like that, I don't think would be a huge barrier in Canada. But cannabis users or drug users, someone who says, oh, I, I take microdoses or I take mushrooms, they'll all say they did it in the past. Oh, yeah, I smoked marijuana before. That's yeah. fine. They'll all admit to being creepy, yeah. but it, I didn't like it. You know, it's, millions of Canadians love smoking cannabis or have enjoyed it. The politicians, they never seem to really like it very much. They're always, well, I used to do it, but it wasn't for me. I didn't like it. I didn't inhale. I didn't only try it a few times. So I think there's still, you know, clearly a lot of unnecessary stigma around cannabis, uh, mm -hmm. which is which is bizarre to me. You know, it, it's, it's a beneficial substance. It's very useful. It's got all kinds of medical needs and the, all these guys will, will, will happily pose with beers, but will refuse to confess that they use cannabis. Uh, so you see, we still have a lot of work to do in that way. Yeah, absolutely. Grab a drink, my friend. I'm drinking some coca tea right now, actually. Oh God, I am so jealous of that. You know, um, it's interesting because when I first heard that you were selling uh, coca plants and uh, you could come and have a coca leaf experience, I, I noticed that you mentioned South America. Um, I was in uh, Somalia, in Ethiopia, uh, 25 years ago. And in Ethiopia, one of the, the guy in the little village I was in, the little warlord that was there, and all of the men in the village were chewing what they called kat. And, ah, yeah, and, yeah. Yes. And what that was, what I was told, was coca leaf. And no. what was it? What was it? And okay, well, that was what they told me was, and, and they said when you chewed it, uh, that it would be like drinking a beer. And uh, I, I got to chew some and I tried it, but I, I wasn't sure if that was the same. So that no, was one of the is not, I had. That is not the same as coca leaf. They're different plants, but cot is widely used in Somalia and in the Canadian Somalian community. We have a lot of Somalians, especially in Toronto and Ontario, big Somalian community there. Cat's a different herb. It's spelled Q-A-T or K-H-A-T, depending on the variation. But but cat has a stim it's kind of similar to coca in some ways. It's a kind of a stimulating effect and also sort of a relaxing effect. I'm not like an expert on cat. I know it was banned in Canada in the 1990s. They didn't tell the Somalian community they were banning it. And they started arresting people <laughs> for this herb who didn't even know. And they, people would bring it in from Somalia and from Africa. I think it's got to be kept fresh. So if you dry cat out or preserve it, it loses a lot of its potency. So it has to be brought in fresh or garbage it fairly fresh. I've never mm -hmm. chewed cat. I've tried to get it into our shop as a live plant and it's been challenging, but I'd love to carry it there. 
but no, cod is not the same as coca leaf. There are different things. I'm sure coca is being grown in, in, in Africa in some places. It grows and you can grow it in Canada too, but it can't get icy or cold or frosted. It's got to stay warm. So in Canada, you got to grow it indoors or uh, in a window or something. If you put it outdoors in the summer, it'll be fine. But in the winter, it will die from the cold. Uh, but the, the, actually, the before, like cat, I mean, a coca, you know, was used in South America for thousands of years. It didn't really make it into Europe like tobacco did, which came over very quickly after Europeans started coming into, into the Americas. But coca leaf took a long time because it didn't preserve well. So they would bring it back and it would, it would lose its potency and not really be worthwhile transporting it. It wasn't until the 1800s when they were able to extract cocaine and learn how to make cocaine out of it that coca leaf became more popular in, the, in Europe. And it was in the form of a wine drink. Ven Mariani, a guy named Mariani, Angelo Mariani in Italy, created a coca wine. And he was a genius at marketing also, and really the first guy to really do kind of modern style advertising. He would send free cases of his coca wine to politicians and popes and royalty, and they would drink it and endorse it. And he would put out books and posters. His wine was endorsed by two popes, by American presidents, by royalty all across Europe. Thomas Edison, yeah, Jules Verne, all these top writers and authors and inventors of the time were all endorsing his product. Uh, Pope, I think Pope Leo, II, Pope Leo II <laughs> would carry around of coca wine, a flask on his hip and really enjoy drinking it. And um, so that was the really popular product. And then it was actually, and you know, Coca-Cola, of course, also was a coca drink. Coca-Cola started out as a, as a as an alcohol drink, uh, copying Ben Mariani. Ben Mariani was so popular, there was a lot of imitators, and one of them was a Coca drink uh, that came out of Atlanta, Georgia, created by a veteran named Pemberton. He called it, I think, Pemberton's Coca wine or French Coca wine or something. Then, when alcohol prohibition came into play, it came into play at the state level in Georgia before it was at the federal level in the U.S. So he changed his drink and added and made it Coca-Cola instead, made it a soft drink. And uh, Coca-Cola was, was very popular for the cocaine and the cola nut was where they would get the caffeine from. And actually it was during, uh, it was originally a white person's drink only because they were in a segregated state. Black people weren't allowed into soda shops. They didn't have access to Coca-Cola. It was seen as an intellectual beverage used by whites, which made them more writable, made them write more, made them talk more, made them smarter. When, when black people started being allowed to access Coca-Cola, then there was a racial aspect. Oh, these blacks are going to get all hopped up on cocaine. This is going to be a big problem. And that is why ultimately Coca-Cola took cocaine out of their recipe. Although they kept the Man, cocaine. I didn't know that. It's really fascinating history. I've only learned this recently. There's a few great books on it, but there's definitely a racial aspect to the how Coca-Cola changed their formula. But they wow. still have to have coca in it. And it's because coca, you can't patent the word coca because it's a natural word, right? So mm -hmm. you can't, so the only reason Coca-Cola can use coca and other people can't is because they've got coca leaf in their drink. If they ever stopped using coca leaf in Coca-Cola, then the word coca, they wouldn't be able to use it in the same way or have control over that word. So it's got a lot to do with their patents and control. Coca-Cola is the wow. world's largest importer of coca leaf. They have a deal with the Peruvian government. They buy large quantities of coca leaf. It's actually a separate company called the Stepan Corporation. Stepan is like a subsidiary of Coca-Cola that works with them. It's a separate company. They buy the coca leaf they, at, a, at a factory in New Jersey. They take the cocaine out. They, they sell that cocaine to pharmaceutical companies for the limited uses that are still out there. Maybe the CIA gets some. That's a little debatable, but some ah, people seem yeah. to do that. And then, and then they use the rest of it in their drink. And when you take the cocaine out of coca, out of coca leaf, you're not left with a delicious after product. You're left with kind of a slurry sludge or whatever. So but by putting that into their drink, they're able to maintain we are coca. We're the only company allowed to have a coca drink. A lot of colas out there because cola nut and cola, you can't, but, but coca, they have the control uh. of that. And here's an interesting sidebar. During the 80s, they were getting worried about their coca access. In the 80s and 90s, Reagan was pushing for eradication of coca plants. So first, Coca-Cola decided, we got to grow coca ourselves. And they tried to launch a coca plantation with the University of Hawaii. And they were trying to grow coca leaf 
in Hawaii to maintain their coca supply in case the American government eradicated it from Peru and Bolivia or these countries decided to ban it and they couldn't get a legal supply anymore. And so for several years, they were trying to grow coca in Hawaii at this plantation, but they had so many failures. They couldn't grow it properly and they kept on getting hit by funguses and, and, uh, and things that were ruining their crops. <clears throat> so after quite a few years, they gave up on this plantation and the U.S. government said, oh, there's a fungus that wipes out coca plants. So they took it over and they started this fungus is called Fusarium oxysporum. And they started saying, oh, we're going to release this stuff across Peru and Bolivia and wipe out their that coca That was what crops. they sprayed? They were, they were looking at this. Ultimately, they, sprayed? ultimately they, they did some experiment with it. They decided not to pursue it, although there was some... Yeah coca blight that people think might have been the U.S. government doing this. They don't know for sure, but it was a serious thing for quite a while looking at this. And Coca-Cola, then they were like, well, why don't we introduce a new formula? We all know the story of New Coke when they brought in the new formula for Coca-Cola, the new flavor. Part of it was Pepsi was getting better results with their taste test. They wanted to challenge that. But what they didn't tell you was that New Coke did not use coca leaves. They were trying to find a way to make a drink without coca leaves and calling it new coke instead of coca gave them an opportunity but obviously new coke was a huge failure and they went back to their original coca leaf formula but they, they didn't reveal this it wasn't revealed until later that the new coke had no coca leaves and it was their attempt to come up That's with a so formula great. to keep coca-cola out there without coca leaves but now they realized that wasn't going to work Coca-Cola still is the biggest grower of coca leaves and they feel their supply is safe right now but there's a lot of hidden history Coca-Cola and coca leaves most people don't really know about. Coca-Cola, of course, does not like to talk about this and really does not want to discuss it. But the reality is they are kind of behind coca prohibition in some ways. When South American companies, people in Peru and Bolivia, have tried to make their own coca drinks with coca leaf and they call it coca sec or coca this or coca that because it has coca. But the, but the World Trade Organization and the UN will go in there and tell them you cannot do this. Coca-Cola owns co coca name and coca drinks and you can't make these and coca-cola gets the stuff shut down when they were writing the treaties against coca leaves in the un coca-cola contacted harry anslinger who was putting these things in place at the un level and you, i've got copies of the letters there's a great book and it has letters from the coca-cola executives to the un and coca-cola made sure that their safe coca leaf supply was entrenched in un treaties so un treaties allow for coca to be used for drinks when it's being decoconized. They call that the Coca-Cola Joker at the time. It was called the Coca-Cola Joker because the Coca-Cola really was the only company able to take advantage of this loophole in the treaties. They were written specifically for Coca-Cola. They were involved in writing them. And this is how Coca-Cola is able to get coca leaf when no one else can. If you and I tried wow. to make a coca leaf drink, we're not gonna be able to get coca leaf. Only Coca-Cola mm -hmm. can do that. They have all these special exemptions written in there. So. That's just a little. Well, I didn't even know. I didn't even know you could even get a coca coca plant into a store or sell coca plant leaf. Well, until you can. You I mean, I, yeah, it's not legal either. I mean, I'm bringing coca leaf in. I mean, the mushrooms, to be honest, are more prof. People are more interested in mushrooms. They're more profitable. We sell a lot more mushrooms than we do coca leaf. But the coca is a very challenging to bring into the country. It, it's considered a Schedule One drug, right? So coca leaf and cocaine in Canada. They're considered the same. Well, a judge might treat it differently if you're charged with one or the other, right? But in terms of the law, the law says coca leaf, coca plants, and everything you can make out of them, including cocaine, is all in the schedule. So, and coca seeds are very difficult to work with. Unlike cannabis seeds, which you can store for years if done properly, coca seeds, they make little berries on the coca plant. Each berry has one little seed in it. But these seeds, if you dry them out, they, they're dead. You have to keep them fresh and they live in a jungly kind of climate where they will fall to the ground and they'll grow instantly. You don't have a lot of seasons in the equatorial regions where coca grows. It's equatorial. So they they grow all year round. The seeds will sprout all year round. But getting coca seeds into Canada to grow coca plants here is difficult. I get very low germination rates. Sometimes it'll take a month for the mail to get here because we don't like sending them by express. And so by the time they arrive, the seeds are dead. So I, I think I'm the biggest coca leaf grower in Canada, but I've only got about 80 plants going and I sell them in the shop. My goal is to try to produce enough coca big enough that I can harvest and create Canadian grown coca leaf to sell. 
not that I want to cut out the South American market. I don't think I can grow enough to meet our demand, but just that it'd be fun to be able to produce Canadian grown, homegrown coca leaf, right? But we bring right. in a lot of coca leaf. It's very challenging to get it into the country. Customs definitely intercepts and seizes some of our orders. Um, we also bring it in in powder form to make the tea. It's just coca leaf that's been ground into a powder. That's a little easier to get through customs because there's a lot of green powders around, right? But coca leaf is a very distinctive shape. There's something in them coming in the mail from Peru with coca leaf in it is quite likely to be intercepted. So we use the powdered coca leaf to make our tea products. We've kind of Starbucksified coca tea. So in South America, they just make coca tea with a tea bag and then a cup of hot water. They make it that way. Maybe add a little milk or sugar yeah. if you want. But I've, I've taken it a, a different step. So we do coca chino, which is a coca tea mixed mm. with you know steamed milk and flavoring. We make our coca tea very strong. We kind of treat it like espresso. So we do shots of coca tea, which we then mix with other things to make different drinks. So our coca tea is actually the coca brew, the really strong version mixed with, with, with like a hot water, like you'd make an Americana with espresso shots mixed with hot water, right? So we make right. really strong coca brew, we make coca chinos, we make sparkling coca sodas and different kinds of coca drinks like that. And it's been quite successful. People really like it, but it's a challenge. I can't really push it too much because I have a limited supply, right? So I'm going to run out if right. I really start wholesaling it or something so it's really only available at our shop and by mail order in Canada but I'm really proud of that being able to offer that to people and you know to me from my perspective what we call the war on drugs is really a war on plants and with cannabis it's easy to see that because cannabis is it's, it's in its natural form a cannabis bud is just plucked off a plant let it dry it's ready to smoke or be consumed but when you see like a white powder like cocaine it's hard to recognize that that actually comes from a plant but of course, coca leaf in its whole form is a wonderful plant. And I think cocaine should be legalized too. But I really feel that if coca was legal in all of its forms, that using cocaine would actually diminish in many ways. And people would prefer to chew the leaf or drink tea or maybe have products that are a little stronger than that, but still much milder than cocaine. And the example I give is, is caffeine powder. You can buy caffeine powder. You can take straight caffeine. You can snort caffeine if you want to. It's entirely legal. And some folks do. If you Google in, uh, snorting caffeine, you'll find Reddit threads talking about it. There's a community of people that like to snort caffeine, but they are a tiny, tiny minority of caffeine users. The vast majority of us who use caffeine, which is most people on earth, caffeine is the most popular drug on earth. They drink it in a coffee or espresso. Maybe they take a monster energy drink, maybe a caffeine pill if you really want a strong caffeine, but even that's very rare, even though they're widely available. And I think that if coca leaf was widely available, that snorting cocaine would become a lot less popular. People tend towards milder versions of drugs when they're available. When marijuana is mm -hmm. more available, the people turn to, well, I'm going to eat the strongest edible I can and get as high as I possibly can from cannabis no actually the most popular rapidly growing type of cannabis post legalization is cbd and lower potency products are becoming much more popular with with mushrooms now that mushrooms are trending towards legalization is it taking heroic dosages and talking to god and having these powerful trips some folks do that but the vast majority it's actually microdosing is becoming the most popular and so i yeah. think that if coca was legal in all its forms that although some people would start cocaine, it would actually reduce the use of that. People would be more likely to take it in these milder forms. I love chewing coca leaf. I love drinking coca tea. I've taken cocaine in the past. It was okay, but I have no desire. I much prefer drinking coca tea and chewing coca leaf to snorting cocaine. It's a much more pleasant effect. It lasts longer. It's easier to build into your day and to do stuff. I get a nice boost that makes me more talkative and more energized and more focused, but I don't, I don't, it doesn't cause me problems. And I don't think snorting cocaine has those similar kind of effects. It's a different kind of a thing. And so I think that should be allowed. I think, you know, everything should be legal, but I think that offering milder forms of these substances, I mean, with opium too, I think if we had opium dens and opium tea and smoking opium, I think the use of fentanyl and heroin would be drastically reduced. And that people yes. would tend towards the milder options. And of course, drinking opium tea can have problems around its use, but those problems are very insignificant compared to the problems of injecting or using street heroin and street fentanyl, which are a lot more risky. So I think that prohibition, as we know, tends towards 
the stronger, more dangerous, more concentrated versions of drugs. And legalization, conversely, tends towards the milder, safer forms. Most people prefer milder, safer forms of drugs to stronger ones. And that should be what our public policy is about, encouraging people, not forcing them through the force of law, but nudging people towards the milder forms and the safer forms. Just like with alcohol, beer and wine have their problems. But drinking beer is much safer than drinking whiskey, and drinking whiskey is safer than guzzling Everclear or 100% pure alcohol, which is out there, but right. vast majority of people don't drink that. People don't really enjoy the strongest possible alcohol, right? So in every situation, people tend towards milder forms, and that's what I'm working at, showing that the war on drugs is a war on plants, teaching people about coca leaf and about the benefits of these plant medicines. Well, and you know, the other, that kind of leads us nicely into one of your other uh, humble creations from a few years ago, which was get your drugs tested. And this might be, you know, in the long run, one of the things that you might end up being most well known for. You opened that uh, testing facility. Why? What specifically, what drug was, was concerning you enough that you thought that this was, was necessary at that time? Well, the community you're talking about is called the downtown east side. And definitely East Hastings is a big, that's the, kind of the main street down that area. And the yeah. downtown east side is actually Canada's poorest postal code, right in the heart of a very wealthy city. Uh, and a lot of street people there, a lot of homelessness. And if you're homeless in other parts of, of Vancouver or the, the cities around Vancouver, they'll put you in that area. You're shuff, shuffled into that community, right? So a lot of homeless people, a lot of street people, a lot of open drug use, a lot of drug selling cannabis, but also heroin and down and other things. And there's the first injection sites in Vancouver were located in the downtown east side. And um, so a couple of years ago, I was I was seeing this and, and, and there is a limited drug testing offered by the province of British Columbia, but it's very limited and very hard to access and only really available inside the safe injection sites and only a few days a week for a few hours a day. It's not really accessible for most people. <clears throat> so I thought, well, we can buy one of these machines. It's called an FTIR, which stands for Fourier Transform Infrared. Basically, it's about the size of a bread box. It's got an infrared laser. And you put a tiny little sample of any drug into it and it shines the laser on it, then it analyzes the light spectrum that comes out of that and compares it to a database with thousands and thousands of things in it. And they can tell you what that substance is. These machines weren't actually designed for drugs. They were originally designed for like soil samples and chemical analysis and companies doing those kind of things. But any database, so we, we when we buy the machine, they also sell you a database and ours is, is drug designed for drugs. So we have a lot of the drugs in our database. And so we bought one of these machines. I decided it would be kind of a small service we could offer to our community to test drugs locally. Now we've become the biggest and busiest drug testing center on earth. We've done over 25,000 samples that we've analyzed over the last two and a half wow. years. Um, we put them all online and getyourdrugstested.com along with photos and analysis. So anybody can look at our database. It's, it's searchable. You can look up things every cocaine sample with whatever other substance is in it, or you can really do a, a detailed analysis and really dig into the data. And it's really helpful for drug users to know what they're taking. And so what I, what I like about ours, we're on the edge of the downtown east side. So people in that community can access our service. We're open eight hours a day, seven days a week. We offer tests for free. There's no charge. We encourage donations, but the donations we get are less than one or 2% of our operating budget. So we pay for this from the cannabis and mushroom money, mostly cannabis money. But now that the mushroom dispensary is getting busier, that's going to be able to start funding it too. But, uh, but yeah, we, we, we now have three of these machines where, where we bought a, a, a van, like a, a truck, so we can offer mobile testing this summer when the music festivals start kicking up, getting going again. And we can also drive to different mm -hmm. places. But uh, where we're doing two thirds of all the drug testing in British Columbia, even though we only have three of these machines, uh, the province now has like 15 or 16 of these machines all around the province but they don't use them. They barely use them, right? So, so they'll be at an injection site for two or three hours. Being at an injection site is a good place to be for those users, but it's a really high barrier for like a, an ecstasy, someone who wants to get their ecstasy tested or their LSD tested yeah. or whatever thing like that to go into an injection site 
it can be a, a very intimidating place to be inside if you're not used to that, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. So we're we're able to offer it a different way. So we end up testing a lot more. Like we test a lot of down. Down is kind of the street name for heroin, fentanyl, or benzos or anything that kind of brings you down. But we also test a lot of psychedelics and a lot of cocaine and a lot of you know GHB and things like that. That that people are not they're not getting them tested. We work with the BC Center on Substance Use to provide them with our data, and we have overwhelmed their system because they're they're kind of they're doing sort of a study on whether this is a good idea to get your drugs tested and does anybody want to get them tested, and we have just overwhelmed them with our with our data results where they're having trouble keeping up with all the data we're giving them. And I think we've proved there is a real demand for this service. You know, we are we're doing thirty to forty tests a day, well over a thousand a month now. And the only real limit is how people not not knowing we exist. We also offer it by mail as well, and we're the only place in Canada where anybody can mail us a sample. Now, when we when you do the test, it takes about ten minutes. So most people drop off their sample, they wait, we give them the result right then. If you don't want to wait, you can give us your phone number or email address. We can text you or call you or email you, and give you the results that way as well. We don't just give them the result. We also tell them what it means. Even if the drug is what you expected it to be, we will still give you some guidance. Okay, well, you thought it was MDMA. It really is MDMA. Here's a little advice on how to use MDMA safely and make sure you're uh-huh. taking it properly. You know, so, oh, it wasn't MDMA. It's actually this or that. Well, maybe you don't want to take it. Maybe you still want to take it, but here's a way of, of taking that drug safely. And, or maybe it is MDMA, mm. but it's been cut in half. And so the potency is less. Maybe it's really pure. Well, maybe you used to be taking MDMA that was less pure. So for you, one tablet was good. This stuff's stronger. Maybe you only do half a tablet because it's stronger yeah. than what you were getting used to. So it's not, sometimes we find fentanyl and things where it shouldn't be. That's obviously a big problem, but sometimes it's not about like a life or death situation. It's more just about like having a shitty trip or having a good trip or getting nothing at all. Thinking you got a drug and really it's just neutral and you've got nothing. So all these questions are involved in the, in the use of these things. And, uh, and so, yeah, we've been able to analyze all kinds of samples. The FTIR is not perfect. It has a threshold of like four or five percent. So something in there less than five percent of the sample, we won't always pick it up. So we use test strips for fentanyl and for other other substances so we can try to get information and do the best we can. It's not perfect. I wish drug users could have their drugs tested before they buy them, like everything else with a label on it that actually represents what's in the substance. But failing that—that that, that was one of my questions. That was one of my questions about buying them, buying them before they bought them. That was one of my questions. I was going to say that you know, do you ever get uh, guys come in and say, "Listen, I'm, uh, I got an ounce of this, uh, this cocaine. Can you check this out and see if this is actually?" Uh, uh, I mean, we definitely get for it. We definitely get dealers coming in. We don't ask people, you know, if they're a dealer or not. That's not really any of our mm-hmm. business. But when people come in with a book with like 15 different samples of MDMA, all categorized <laughs> and organized. And I think that's good. We're, we're creating accountability yeah. in the drug market. Dealers often don't know what they're buying either. They get something from one person. They sell it to someone else. They don't know what's in it always. They don't know exactly how pure it is or what is good. And most dealers I know, I think, are ethical people who want to provide a quality product to their customers. It's like with marijuana. Some dealers are only in it for the money. A lot of marijuana dealers are in it because they love marijuana and they want to make it available. And of course, they make a living at it, but they're also motivated by wanting to share the wonders of marijuana with other people. A lot of other drug dealers are the same. It's a job, but they also care about their customers. They want to provide quality products. So when they come in and get their stuff tested, they're able to, to know what they're selling. And I mean, not everybody can go back to their dealer and go, hey, this isn't what you said it was, but many can. And they'll buy, they'll get it tested from us. It's not what they thought it was. They go back to the guy who sold it to them and said, hey, you sold me that. You told me it was this. It was actually that. It's creating accountability in the, in the Vancouver drug market in an unprecedented way. And I think that's really important. And I think it's, it's good for people to, to know what they're taking. It's good for dealers to know what they're selling. And in a perfect world, we wouldn't be needed. I wish we could close down because either drugs were being sold in a responsible way or the health authorities, whose job this really is, were running a proper testing program and we could shut down. It's been a huge investment for us. We spent well over half a million dollars on putting this program together. The machines are 50 grand each. Three of the machines are $150,000. They don't require any huge amount of training to operate. It takes a couple of weeks of training, but you don't have to have a PhD or have some kind of chemical analysis certificate. Anybody can run the machine after a few weeks of training, but there's rent, there's staff, 
all these costs, buying the truck, offering mobile testing, it adds up. And it's been, you know, it's been over two years, right? So it's been a big investment. But one that I think is really paying off in terms of stopping overdoses, stopping bad drug experiences and making a better drug market in Vancouver and ultimately across Canada. And there's a little interesting trivia there because we do accept samples by mail. The mailbox, we get them to has my name on it. So when you send the sample in, you're sending it to Dana Larson, PO box da, 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 at the Vancouver <laughs> Post Office. So I, and I've, we've received a couple of thousand samples in the mail. It's about 10% of our mm -hmm. samples come in the mail, 90% come from our storefront. So I think I, you that know, I've had more... I, yeah, that, I think I've had more people send me drugs in the mail than anyone else under my own name than anyone else ever. I don't think anyone else has ever had 2000 people send them drugs in the mail under their own name. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm waiting for the Guinness Book of World's Records to call and give me my award or whatever for the record of most people sending me drugs. It's just kind of a funny... That's great. <laughs> but I wish we could get, you know, I, we're trying to spread the word across Canada so we get more samples in the mail. Of course, in the mail, you have to wait a little bit. But once we get it, we will, you will get the results the same day. So the only delay is the postal system, right? Most drug users don't want to wait around for a week to get their test results back, right? So and, we do the and best how we large can to be as fast as we can. How Go large ahead. of a sample do they have to send? Uh, how big of a tiny, sample do tiny, they have to tiny, send? Like, like, like 0 0.01 grams, like, like 10 milligrams or so. It can be very tiny sample. So a little bit of a scraping off a pill. Now, we can't test organic things. So you send us a cannabis bud. We can't tell you if it's got pesticides on it. We can't tell you how much THC is in it. That requires a gas chromatography test. That machine is much more expensive, and it also costs money. Every test costs like $20 to run that kind of machine. That is not within our budget, but the FTIR has become really the standard for drug analysis around the world. Um, but we can, if you bring us pure THC or pure CBD, we can tell you if it is indeed that or if it's got something else in it. We, we can test you know, other chemicals and things like that. So pretty much any street drug, cocaine, heroin, MDMA, uh, LSD, we can't run LSD through the, through the FTIR. We can use a, a reagent test to see if it does test positive for LSD or not. So we can't really tell you how strong your LSD tab is. LSD comes in such tiny quantities. It's very difficult to tell you how potent that tab is, but we can tell you whether it has LSD on it or not. So some substances we can give more information than others, you know, but we always do our best to provide the best information we can. Even with a pressed pill, you think of scraping off that pill and, and we analyze it, that tells us what's in that scraping. Doesn't guarantee that the whole rest of that pill is exactly the same. If it's mixed poorly, if it's not done properly, there could be something else in there that we didn't get in our sample. So there are limits, but it's definitely better than not being tested at all. And I think for the most part, our test results are accurate and let people make better decisions about their drug use, but it's not perfect. And there's still some caveats involved with our test results that we have to tell people. Are there any new drugs that you're seeing on the market? I mean, uh, a, a different uh, formats. I know, you know, DMT, GHB, uh, those are all, you know, kind of been growing in prevalence around. Is there something new that you've been seeing? So we're seeing, we're seeing in the, in the down market, down used to be mainly heroin, right? And then it's become fentanyl mixed with caffeine. In fact, oddly, caffeine comes up more in our tests than anything else. Caffeine is used to cut pretty much everything. So caffeine shows up in MDMA. It shows up in cocaine sometimes. It shows up with heroin and fentanyl a lot. Uh, and I think caffeine also increases the uptake of, of opioids. So when you smoke caffeine and heroin or caffeine and fentanyl together, more of the fentanyl or heroin will be absorbed in your body. It becomes more bioavailable when mixed with caffeine. So that could be part of the reason it's commonly used too. But fentanyl- I always thought when you had an, an accelerant and a depressant at the same time, that was like speedballing. You know, it may be, and I, I haven't taken fentanyl and, and cocaine, I mean, fentanyl and caffeine together or heroin and caffeine. So I can't speak from personal use, but what we call down on the street is now almost always fentanyl and caffeine mixed together. That is a very common recipe for down. And I'm not sure if the caffeine, aside from the bio uptake, <clears throat> some people say it stops them going on the nod in the same way. So when you take an opiate, especially injecting it, you kind of fall asleep a little bit or kind of pass out a little bit. Ca caffeine might stop that from happening. I'm not really sure chemically why this is the case, but it is very common to see these things mixed together. What we're seeing now 
is aside from other fentanyl, things like carfentanyl, which is stronger than fentanyl, we're also seeing benzodiazepines in the down supply too. So atizolam is commonly seen now. And these are things that, you know, they're not really designed to be injected or smoked. They're mostly supposed to be taken in a pill form. And they can produce overdoses, especially when combined with so fentanyl and like atizolam together can be quite uh, easy to cause an overdose. And things like naloxone or Narcan they will not stop the atizolam. It's a different chemical. So naloxone is good for fentanyl and heroin and opiate overdoses, but not good for a benzodiazepine overdose. And so it becomes more challenging as more things get into the drug supply. It's hard to, to you know, deal with the health consequences of that. So we're seeing more benzos out there in the down supply. We also see things, you know, a very common situation is MDMA and MDA being sold as each other. So a lot of times people think they have MDMA they actually have MDA instead. And they're somewhat similar substances, but they're not the same and can produce different effects. They're both kind of psychedelic and pathogens, but MDMA is much more, I think, connecting, more emotional and more uh, sort of heart chakra opening kind of an effect. MDA is more sort of, of a psychedelic hallucinational kind of experience, but less of that emotional kind of connection that people really, I think, seek out and enjoy with MDMA. And so there's things like that. Um, a 2CB is kind of an esoteric psychedelic. Most people don't really know what 2CB is, but we do see it more often. And we also see it uh, mislabeled or other things mislabeled as 2CB. You get weird combinations. We've had people come in, only one guy actually came in with what he thought was MDMA. It was actually meth mixed with Viagra. And so when you take an MDMA capsule, you get energized. People like to dance and party on MDMA. And a oh meth capsule God. will produce similar effect. Taking a meth orally will give you, a, it doesn't have the same rush, but you'll get like, an, a, you'll want to dance and party all night. And then Viagra, it won't make and you. more. Yeah, it'll make you <laughs> horny and give you an erection, but you don't really have the, the sensuality and the love and attachment you get with MDMA. So that's not really what you want. But we see that we see Viagra quite a bit, actually. Viagra. And, um, and Cialis, uh, Tadalafil, uh, uh, and these things are, are out there fairly often, uh, sometimes mixed together, which you're not really supposed to mix those two things together, uh, sometimes with other drugs as well. Uh, but so you see things like that that you wouldn't really expect. And, uh, and sometimes we just see things that aren't, aren't active at all, just a, a carbohydrate pill or some other kind of pill. There's a lot of pressed pills out there um, and a lot of pressed pills that look identical to the pharmaceutical version of the pill but it'll have different ingredients and so we'll see things that are benzodiazepines but like they're being sold as xanax or as uh, as valium but they're actually a tizolam with their base and so a tizolam is stronger and easier to make so it's like like selling heroin but actually it's fentanyl with other stuff mixed into it we'll see that with benzos when they think they're getting xanax or valium but really they're getting a small amount of a tizolam a tizolam it's not a perfect comparison but it's kind of the fentanyl of of benzos and that it's stronger and more potent in, in lower dosages. Uh, it's not quite as risky as fentanyl is, but it definitely has risks involved and can cause overdoses and deadly overdoses. And so these kind of things are happening. And of course, prohibition pushes people to these kind of forms of these drugs, right? Fentanyl would not be a thing in the drug market if we didn't have prohibition. Uh, because you know, if you're if you're a cartel operator or someone who's who's smuggling drugs, well, you're going to grow. You're going to make heroin. You've got to get farmers to grow opium for you. Then you've got to buy that opium, get a big thing, process it into heroin, and then smuggle heroin across the border to get it into the countries you want to produce it in. That's a that's a big challenge. Fentanyl. A couple of guys in a lab in the middle of nowhere can produce a large quantity of fentanyl. It's much easier to smuggle because it's potent in such small quantities that an ounce of fentanyl much more profitable than an ounce of heroin is. And then you break it down on the other end. And so that is a big push. It's not, you know, because people want fentanyl, it's because there's a push towards that. Just like alcohol prohibition, of course, they weren't smuggling beer and wine. You'd smuggle the most potent alcohol you can make and then dilute it on yeah. the other end. Same with yeah. this, right? And so um, 
This is a trend, of course, but uh, but we get fascinating data. Getyourdrugstested.com. People should go check it out. And you know, we do accept samples from overseas. People do sometimes mail us samples from other countries. I don't really encourage that because I don't want anybody to get in trouble in their own country mailing us something. But you know, if you put a fake return address on it and drop it in a post box, it's it's not going to get tracked back to you. If it makes it to our mailbox, we will analyze it and send the results to whatever email address you give us. So we do get international samples on occasion as well, which I think is a good thing. Uh, but, you know, it, it's, it's an expensive service to operate. It has its own challenges, but I'm very proud of Get Your Drugs Test. And I think it's one of the best things we've done. And said so my original vision was just kind of a small scale thing, but it's really grown. And, uh, and I think it's going to continue growing. Our challenge now is keeping up. We're getting backlogged. We're getting too many samples and we don't, we don't have <laughs> unlimited finances, right? So we want to test everybody's yeah. stuff, but starting to get backlogged and starting to put more money into it you know we're trying to create a, a charity we're a non-profit society we're trying to create a chair get charitable status so we can give tax receipts and and uh, get more donations going but uh the nice. reality is this, this shouldn't be up to people like me doing this this should be something run by our health authorities british columbia's a government british columbia's government says they support safe drug supply they support decriminalizing drug users they support, uh, you know, uh, destigmatizing drug use, and yet when it comes to something very simple for us, half a million dollars is a huge investment and a very challenging amount of money to put into this. I'm not, we're not rich, you know, we're rich enough to be able to pay for this, but we're not, I, you know, we don't have tons of money. We're putting it back into our community, but but for the health authorities, half a million dollars is nothing. They, for a couple of million dollars, they could bring this kind of testing all around British Columbia to every community in the province, and they're just not doing it. And to me, that's really frustrating when they are saying a lot of the right things, but when it comes to putting their money where their mouth is, it's not there. So this is a challenge. Yep. Of course, it's better than the government status saying drug users all belong in jail and, you know, where anything <laughs> that supports <laughs> helping drug users is, is uh, facilitating drug use and, and, and enabling, and it's terrible. I mean, BC is a lot better than that. But compared to where we should be, what they should be doing, it's a real travesty. We are seeing people dying every day in this province, four or five or six deaths a day. And, you know, in the 1990s, when I first started getting involved in this, there was about one overdose death a day in British Columbia. And at the time, that was a, considered a huge health problem. There was big discussions. The chief coroner of British Columbia was going all around the province. There was huge hearings. He issued a big report calling for all the same things we want now, safe supply, decriminalization, and in the war on drugs. That was 30 years ago. It's only gotten worse since then. And now in British Columbia, if we got back to where it was in the 90s, if we got back to one death a day, that would be considered problem solved. We did it. We did it. Problem solved. And yet one death a day is still like it was, a, it, you know, it shows how bad things have gotten that going back to what was considered a, an emergency 30 years ago would now be considered a huge victory because and but it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse and worse. And these numbers are only going to keep going up. Mm. Well, I've got, I've got two notes here that I wanted to go back to. Um, one of them uh, was talking about MDMA, and I'm going to use this to get to your mushroom shop. Uh, years and years ago, when MDA, MDMA first came out, uh, my father allegedly knew one of the guys that was one of the original creators of this. And I think it came from, he said it came from some guy that created a Texas A&M. And when uh, he got thousands and thousands, because they were giving it away, you know, when it first came out. And uh, one of the things that, that was really interesting about uh, the whole process is that when you got bought a pill or two pills, it came with a little booklet. And the booklet said the MDMA experience. And you opened it up and it literally talked you through taking MDMA the proper way. So how to set your set and setting. Uh, uh, don't try to eat anything beforehand because you're going to lose your appetite. Uh, don't have fluids available. Uh, light some candles. Uh, and have relax. You know, it literally told you everything about the drug, how it was going to affect you, how long it was going to last, how long you can extend it. In the book, it said you can take up to one or two more after this in order to extend it. And after that, it will have the same kind of experience uh, for you after that period of time. I mean, it was very, it was beautiful. And, and um, 
I noticed that when when we get to your uh, when we get to your shop when we get to the uh, the coca leaf uh, cafe and we start looking at your magic mushrooms and I think I saw a golden teacher you have a, a version of something that's an al albino uh, penis envy I think uh, version and there was another one that I didn't recognize the third one that uh, is another uh, uh, cultivar um, but your descriptions of Here's some information about set and setting, how much to take, what the right dosages are. And you're selling both fresh mushrooms and dehydrated or uh, dried mushrooms, right? Well, we sell, we sell dried mushrooms. We don't sell fresh mushrooms. We sell microdose capsules. We sell dried mushrooms. And then we sell them in a few different forms. And we actually have like right. eight different strains on the menu right now. But yeah, we have oh, a okay. few different modes. Wow, you have a lot. Yeah, and like you're like you're saying, part of it's just providing people with information. We get a lot of experienced users, but we definitely get a lot of newbies who know nothing about anything, but they've been they've heard that this could help them with their problems or this can help them deal with issues. And so a lot of it's been writing up leaflets and pamphlets and guides. We have a mushroom a side side mushroom users guide. We have a mushroom strain guide. We have a coca leaf users guide. We have an LSD user's guide. We have other, every product we have, we have a pamphlet or a guide on how to use it properly and safely and give, give people some guidance on these things. And of course, mushrooms are very safe in terms of like, like cannabis, you can't die from eating too many mushrooms, but also like cannabis, a really large dose can feel uncomfortable if you're not used to it and can make, you know, eating a lot of marijuana can be quite uncomfortable for people and taking a lot of mushrooms can also be quite uncomfortable. So we guide people on how much to use, how to use it safely, what the setting and setting should be, and all of these things. I think it's important. And of course, you don't get that buying it on the street. <clears throat> and you know, you can go online and find a lot of this information, but not everybody's confident that they're able to suss out the right information from things that might be bad guidance or poor information. And and so, yeah, writing up pamphlets and leaflets. I've been very busy with that the last couple of months and trying to make sure you include all the relevant information for people. And so, right next to our stop, we have this big pamphlet like a, a stand with all our pamphlets in it with all the different guides and how to use all the different things and i'm still learning too you know just like with cannabis all cannabis is kind of similar but there's also different strains that have different effects and different ways of using them and different types of products that should be used in different ways and edibles and drinks and smoking and suppositories and creams are all have different ways of using them and different benefits and different risks or whatever involved or things to be aware of and mushrooms it's the same way and i'm learning more about the medicinal benefits of mushrooms all the time you know people think of it as a psychological thing only and certainly that's part of it i have people that buy microdoses and tell me that it reduces their chronic pain that taking microdoses is an incredible pain reliever <clears throat> a guy sent me a video recently i tweeted it out and put it on my facebook He's got Parkinson's and he's shaking and he's very, can barely speak. And he's got these, these spasms and seizures. I've seen people do that before. They smoke a few puffs up a joint and then you see the seizures calm down, right? We've all seen videos like that. This guy takes a handful of psilocybin dried mushrooms, puts them in his mouth. And within 30 seconds to a minute from kind of sucking on these mushrooms, his seizures have calmed down. He's able to speak coherently. A couple of minutes later, he picks up a flute. He's playing the flute, playing wonderfully, playing the flute very well. And so, you know, using mushrooms to treat seizures and chronic pain and Parkinson's and things like that, that's kind of new to me. But I'm looking at the research yeah. and saying, oh, it's interesting. These things have a lot more. It's not just a psychological thing. There's really serious physical benefits for many people that it can help them in those, in those ways. And the psychology is important too. And these things are all intertwined. But I think exploring, this is with marijuana, where decades and decades of prohibition limited our ability to understand the medical benefits of cannabis. And in the early days, it was like, well, maybe you can help AIDS patients get their appetite back, and maybe you can help deal with nausea. And that was about it. That was the all the accepted use, right? Well, it treats nausea. And now we understand that the endocannabinoid system is intrinsically in, in connected to human health and cannabinoids have all kinds of benefits in all kinds of different areas. And because they deal with the endocannabinoid system, which is involved in regulating homeostasis in people and keeping all of our bodily functions in that you know, happy middle zone for maximizing human health. And that is why cannabinoids seem to affect so many different ailments because they're treating this kind of root situation, this very important vital bodily system. And I think we're only in the beginnings of understanding how the psilocybin and other psychedelics affect not only the mind, but the body in so many ways. And I, I predict, and I think we're seeing it happening, that 
we're going to learn is a lot more than just a psychological benefit, that there are distinct physical benefits, and probably it'll lead to a better understanding of how human bodies work and how our receptors work. Um, I'm looking forward to that. And of course, prohibition and the drug war has, has really set us back decades and decades in understanding how these things work, how to maximize the benefits and minimize the risks involved. Prohibition maximizes the risks and minimizes the benefits. And, uh, and you know, we talk about harm reduction a lot when it comes to drugs and harm reduction is important, but the other side of reducing harm is maximizing benefits. And we need to acknowledge that all of these bad drugs, banned drugs, they all have risks involved. There's risks around cannabis. The risks are pretty minor, but there's risks around cannabis use and there's risks around everything. But there's also a lot of benefits too. And that a proper policy should seek not only to just to minimize the risks, but to maximize the benefits. And I think that's part of the equation that's missing. We only want to acknowledge, well, drugs are bad. We need to minimize the badness. Well, maybe, but we also need to, drugs can be very good. All of these things are used for positive reasons and we need to maximize so, so, the benefits as well as minimize the risks what does the government specifically need to do what specific changes need to be made in order to go forward properly well i mean i would Let's like wait. to see an end to prohibition in general i mean if i was in charge i would eliminate the controlled drug and substances act entirely i think there's two kind of questions the one is around what you do with your own body which I don't think should be controlled because I can buy bleach and inject it into my veins if I choose to. There's a warning label on bleach saying, do not drink this, but it's not a crime for me to drink bleach if I want to. It's not a crime to buy rat poison and inject it into my body. And it shouldn't be a crime. It should be discouraged. We shouldn't encourage it. It should be discouraged, but it shouldn't be a crime. And so I think anything I want to put into my own body should be my choice in that regard. When it comes to selling and marketing things, I think there should be limits, perhaps, on how things are advertised and promoted. I think that some substances should be available and shouldn't be crime, but it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be pushed on people either, right? So we shouldn't be promoting certain things that could be dangerous. But I think our policy should be towards <clears throat> encouraging, nudging people towards milder use of these milder forms and discouraging but not criminalizing use of really strong forms. And I think that's a natural kind of thing. I also think different kinds of regulations should be in place for different substances. So cannabis and mushrooms and psychedelics should be available in certain ways. And really, if we, if we were starting from scratch, you know, the idea that, I mean, I'm not against infra banning anything, but the idea that we sell caffeine with no age limits to minors of any age, and caffeine can be quite addictive or can be habit forming and can have withdrawal yes. symptoms. Anyone who drinks a lot of coffee, tries to quit coffee can know how habit forming and the withdrawal symptoms that can be caused by caffeine, but we don't want to criminalize that. And so I think that in the same way, we need a policy that, that I think treats adults as adults, lets us make our own choices. And we would quickly recognize that the vast majority of harms related to drug use are not inherent to the substances themselves. These harms are often exacerbated and caused by prohibition where there is no mechanism to encourage people to use things responsibly and safely. It's a lot easier to drink opium tea or smoke opium in a safe and responsible manner than it is to use fentanyl in a safe and responsible manner, simply because the one is more concentrated and more difficult to use than the other one is. It's easy to drink beer in a responsible way than it is to drink Everclear. I'm not sure if you know what Everclear is, if it's an American thing, but in Canada, it's, a, it's almost pure alcohol, right? And you can mm -hmm. buy it in a liquor store, but it's much more difficult to, to drink Everclear in a responsible kind of a way because the dose required to give you a nice effect and the dose required to give you too much of an effect is too hard. And even with cannabis, I mean, yeah. cannabis is very safe, but people give me dabs sometimes that knock me on my ass, make me cough, make me very like impaired. I wouldn't want to drive after doing a big dab. I feel comfortable driving after smoking a joint because I can handle that. But to dab, I don't think dabs should be illegal. Many users find dabs very beneficial for a lot of reasons, but for the most part, you know, dabs of pure THC can be quite intense. And most users, I think, don't really enjoy that or seek it out, right? Most people prefer smoking a joint because that gives them the dose they want in the amount they need in a way that's very easy. Oh, I've had enough. I can put it down. When you're doing a dab, you can't really, oh, I had enough of a dab. Like, you're done, right? So I don't think dabs should be illegal. They're still very safe. You're not going to overdose. But I think 
our policy should be to encourage people towards milder forms. Even with cannabis, they don't do that. Our cannabis laws actually encourage eating cannabis over smoking it because they don't let you smoke it anywhere. We have our 420 rallies. People, the haters go, why don't you just go there and eat your brownies instead of smoking it? Then we don't have to smell your ridiculous marijuana smoke. We hate it. But if everyone's eating mm -hmm. cannabis, that's actually like more impairing and less safe and harder to titrate your mm -hmm. dose. And cannabis eating can be great, but people should be mm -hmm. encouraged use it in a responsible way. So I think our drug policies need yeah. to encourage responsible use, safe use, move away from criminalization mm -hmm. of any substance. And the, the question should be around marketing, around how it's sold, around where it's sold, and those kind of things. But ultimately, I think that, you know, our drug policy really needs to begin with an apology. Uh, the best drug policy needs to begin with a recognition that prohibition was the failure and prohibition was the real problem. And until we recognize that, we're not going to get good drug laws, right? It'd be like, you know, decriminalizing homosexuality, or, uh, but still forbidding, but still sort of controlling it or saying, well, we still think it's bad, but we're going to allow it, but we're not going to, you know, no, you got to acknowledge that the, the flaw was the prohibition in the first place. And so place. drug policy needs to begin with an apology and a recognition that the drug prohibition was not based on science, was not even based on morality. It was based on ignorance, bigotry, and racism from a century ago. These drug laws all had their origins in culture wars, in racial conflicts, and in all, all things like that. And we need to, to, if we don't recognize that and move past it, then we're not gonna get good drug policy. So I think that is key. And I think recognizing these are plant medicines also is very important as well. And, you know, one of the speaking of racism, you know, it was one of the uh, surprises to me, you know, uh, uh, when I was living there, the, and legalization just happened right after uh, I left. Um, but one of the things I anticipated was that there was going to be immediately a, a ton of First Nations uh, dispensaries that were going to come out. And that really hasn't evolved, has it? What, 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 no. what's, there are some of that out there, but there's not a lot. I mean, the cannabis industry, especially in the very beginning, was dominated by political insiders and really by a lot of prohibitionists. So we had like the, the head of the RCMP anti-narcotic squad and the head of the RCMP in general. We had politicians who had built their careers on, on, on stigmatizing and criminalizing cannabis users. Our, our former prime minister, Brian Mulroney, who was a conservative prime minister who in the 80s made it illegal to read or to promote anything about cannabis. He banned High Times Magazine and Cheech and Chong movies in Canada. These things were criminalized for a decade. That prime minister, as soon as it was legal, he goes on the board of directors of cannabis companies and is making money promoting cannabis and using right. his political help. At every level, politicians who, the one politician, a conservative, would compared when they were talking about legalization, well, if you're going to legalize stuff, why not legalize murder? You know, if you're going to legalize marijuana, we can legalize murder. That'll drop the crime rate if we just make things not crimes. That guy, as soon as it's legal, <coughs> he's out there with a medical marijuana company. And I mean, all for police yeah. quitting their jobs and, and becoming cannabis advocates, but not if they're going to continue to attack and stigmatize the cannabis community. And so a lot of the early things were that and were political insiders who were able to get their permits and a lot of the original money was being made in the, in the stock market, not in providing quality cannabis to consumers, but in the promise that one day in the future, we're going to make a lot of money. So buy our shares now. And now what we're seeing actually is a whole bunch of lawsuits in the U.S. and in Canada against these companies. Investors are complaining that they were lied to. These companies were setting up huge grow facilities which they knew were not going to work, were not going to come to fruition, but we're going to boost their stock price. And now a lot of these huge growth facilities have shut down. Thousands and thousands of Canadians have been laid off from the cannabis industry over the last few years. And a lot of these insiders knew this was going to happen. They didn't care. It wasn't about building a, a sustainable company for the long term. It was about maximizing profit shares, maximizing stock holdings, and then getting out while the getting is good. And now some of that has, has passed. And now I think the industry is starting to become more diversified and that, but there's still a lot of problems in it. And the licensing is still very difficult. And if you're a small producer, you can't really sell to people. You've got to grow your cannabis, then you've got to sell it to a big producer, then they will sell it to a provincial government that government sells it to the retailer and the retailer sells it to you. So every one of those steps, there's a markup, which pushes the price a lot higher. 
in my ideal world, the cannabis producer could sell directly with wine. You can produce wine. You, people can drive to your winery and you can sell it right to them with no middleman. We need that for cannabis. Also, there's a time delay here because every one of those steps takes weeks, if not months to go through. I see people buying buds and, and it says on it packaged like a year ago. So I don't care how good your marijuana was. If you've got a single gram sitting in a plastic container for a year, even if it's got a Bovida or some kind of humidifier control in there, it's not going to be very good when you get it at the other end. It's, it's, it's too long. And so I think there's the problems like that, getting it to consumers more quickly. And that really makes it hard for small scale growers. So, you know, there's still so much stigma, so much limitation involved. It is slowly easing off, but it will be, you know, decades, I think, before we really get to where it should be with that. And so trying to imagine how they're, what, what's going to happen when they legalize mushrooms or other things and how they'll be regulated. I fully expect regulations that are restrictive and controlling and hard to, hard to, you know, hard to maintain. But I will say that, that growing mushrooms is probably easier than growing marijuana in some ways. Yes. And, uh, and that although it's not that hard to grow marijuana, it's hard to grow world-class medical grade triple a marijuana like growing buds is easy to do anybody can grow marijuana and they'll get high they'll have a nice effect off it but growing really high quality perfect buds in a large scale is very challenging with mushrooms also we sell home grow mushroom kits you bring it home you're going to get two ounces of mushrooms quite easily yes. and that's wonderful right but but yes. you know so i think that it's a bit different i'm hoping that 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 we see more home cultivation of mushrooms and more of that kind of thing happening and unlike cannabis which requires lights and electricity and water and i mean as you can grow cannabis indoors without wrecking your house but certainly people do sometimes ruin houses growing marijuana indoors or being irresponsible but mushrooms they just require a bag and a closet right so yeah, and that's... mushroom users are not using as many mushrooms a cannabis smoker will go through a lot more cannabis and even a heavy mushroom user is not going to go through that many mushrooms right so no. I hope that we see more home cultivation and more personal use of these things cropping up as well. And I'm doing my best to encourage that. Absolutely. Okay, so a couple of things I want to backtrack because you talked about uh, uh, government officials, police and other people that were involved in the process of, of, of for years and years and years of holding back the legalization. And uh, then as soon as everything legalized, they all flipped over. And there is a wonderful uh, a record of this. And Jody Emery on Twitter has a list still. I think it's the number one posted tweet. And it has the full list of every politician and every police officer and every investigator who went from being the people who really kept everything down to flipping to the other side, just so that everybody's aware who's where they, they switched over into what side that they're on currently. Um, that's a huge that's an interesting, huge props to Jody Emery for, for getting that organized and for keeping it up to date, you know, massive props. The, the other things real quickly was about the mushroom kits. I love those kits. Uh, I'm gonna give you my little tip. I talk to my mushroom kits. And I don't, I'm not sure about whether or not there's, there's the, they say that mushrooms talk to each other and, and that they're living species and that, and I've been talking to mine. And when I found when you talk to them and say, God, you guys are looking great today. I just can't wait to see you. And, you know, I'm being super positive and encouraging and I've had better harvest from my little grow kit just from being a nice guy talking to the mushrooms. Well, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. <laughs> Yeah, good stuff. They're probably listening. Who knows, right? I wouldn't be surprised if they're listening and then picking up on your vibe. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. But what's? Uh, tell me what's next. Now, what's what's on the on the horizon now? You've got uh, you've got. I mean, you're fighting. You're fight, still fighting this battle. But I mean, it's uh, it looks like you're making progress. And and what's going to be the next well, guess, uh, horizon? Well, for me, I think. I mean, I think you know, building my mushroom dispensary, maybe opening a second location and providing access that way and, and continuing to expand. I'd love to offer other psychedelics and things like, I mean, MDMA is not really a psychedelic, but I'd love to offer MDMA available. I'm trying to source a supply of that. You can't really microdose MDMA. I mean, you can take a small dose, but you don't, you wouldn't want to microdose MDMA regularly like you do with the psychedelic because it's an amphetamine. And so it has effects, but you can take small dosages, but I think MDMA would be wonderful. But I'm also, 
I mean, I'd love to try to create some kind of safe access for heroin and have a heroin buyer's club or a heroin dispensary of some kind. Now, the, the rules and access would be different between heroin and, and mushrooms. And there's a group in Vancouver called DULF, D-U-L-F, stands for Drug User Liberation Front. And they have been <clears throat> uh, uh, doing what we used to do with cannabis but before it was legal, but we would give it away. We'd have rallies and we'd throw joints to the crowd. We'd have raffles and we'd give away cannabis and hash. Well, these guys are doing that with cocaine and heroin and meth, and they don't throw meth out to the crowd, but they give it to people in public settings. They have protests in front of the police station or other public places. They give it to people that are already users who are kind of screened a little bit, but they're still, they provide it in a box with the warning and with the labeling and everything to make it like that. I, I think that working with them in some way to provide a safe access to heroin in some form would be wonderful. And uh, I would like to do that. The challenge really is getting a, a supply of the product, right? Getting cannabis or mushrooms or these things in Vancouver is not very hard. And since I've opened my mushroom dispensary pretty much two or three times a week, someone comes in trying to sell me mushrooms or mushroom chocolates or capsules or whatever product they've made. So the, just like with cannabis, after we opened our marijuana dispensary, people came in and still come in all the time with edibles and, and buds and things. Mostly we don't pick them up. Sometimes we do, but there's a real cottage industry that's grown around that. With mushrooms, the same thing. Having a heroin dispensary, I don't know if people would come in and try to sell me heroin or not. That would be great if they did, but the access, it's a little harder to get access, right? This is, it's not produced in Canada domestically, like mushrooms and cannabis is, it's imported. So it makes it a bit harder, but if I could find a way to create a safe supply of heroin, that would be excellent. And if I could help Dolph do it some way, that'd be great. But that's kind of my sort of back burner, back pocket project. I'm working on that way. But right now, it's mostly about keeping our mushroom dispensary alive. We've had some pressure from the city and threats from the city about trying to shut us down. Luckily, in Vancouver, it's not going to be the police coming in to raid us. It's going to be a bureaucrat trying to fine us or threatening our landlord or doing things like that. Vancouver actually has more success going after places with bureaucratic means than with a police raid. A police raid, you, you lose your stock, you open again, and it's very expensive for the police and it gets you a lot of free publicity. But if I could, if I could help to provide safe access to other drugs in that way, that would be the next step for me. But uh, you know, it's gonna be a while. But right now I'm working on the psychedelics and, and, and pathogens and things like that. And I hope that my store can survive and thrive and grow and, uh, and continue to be an example for others to build their own places and hopefully to emulate what we're doing, maybe even do it better than I'm doing it. But certainly I'd love to see more of the psychedelic dispensaries across Canada. I feel like we're dismantling the drug war one step at a time. Cannabis was kind of the first, you're not gonna get other legal drugs legal if you can't legalize marijuana, the most socially acceptable and widespread substance of them all. But ultimately to me, I wanna dismantle the whole war on drugs in my lifetime if I can, certainly in Canada anyways. And, uh, and so that's the next step is to introduce more substances. This model of creating a dispensary or a storefront, especially in Vancouver, is very effective. And we, I'm lucky to live in a country where we can get away with this kind of stuff and where we have a strong charter of rights. And in a city where we have a lot of support for this stuff, not everyone supports it, but there's enough political support and enough, I think, support that the police are just not willing to go after, after us on this. And I have a lot of complaints about Vancouver police but compared to police forces in other jurisdictions and around the world, they yeah. are a very progressive police force, especially when it comes to drug issues. And certainly they're not perfect, but I think it's important that we have this freedom here and to use that freedom to get more and to, and to build it for others to also be able to take advantage and to make this spread across Canada and then ultimately around the world. Well, you know what? Props to you. Thank you so much for the fight and the battle that you've done. Thank you. I'll thank you for 10 million people who you spread seeds to. And uh, during that amazing campaign, I, I can't wait to come back to Vancouver and, and come visit your shop. And I hope by then you've got them looking like McDonald's all over Canada by then. Wonderful. Uh, I, I, yeah, oh, man. Um, again, so much respect. Thank you so much for everything that you've done. And thank you for coming on the show. And if anybody wants to contact you, what's the best way to contact you for anything? 
<clears throat> so danalarson.com is my personal website with links to all my stuff. Getyourdrugstested.com is our drugs testing service. Mushroomdispensary.com is my mushroom dispensary. I can't believe that mushroomdispensary.com was still available two years ago when I booked <laughs> it. Uh, cannabisdispensary.ca is my our cannabis site. Potheadbooks.com is my Harry Pothead book and Green Buds and Hash. I also got some comic books about the history of cannabis in Canada and a few other different books that I've written. Um, Potheadbooks.com. And if you go to those websites, that's pretty much I'm po- oh, Coca Leaf Cafe is my is my Coca yes. Leaf Cafe shop. C O C A L E A F Cafe.com. And that's that's all my websites. Feel free to check us out and you can contact me through there if you like as well. I also tweet a lot. At, at the slash Dana Larson. I'm on Twitter. I tweet every day and I have a lot to say there. So if you're on Twitter, feel free to give me a follow. Thank you, my friend. And when are you coming back to Europe? I don't know when I'm coming back to Europe. Uh, I'd like to do some traveling. I think I might try to go back to South America in the fall and reestablish some of my coca leaf contacts there. Europe, <clears throat> maybe this fall, actually. Actually, we've been talking about doing a trip with my dad and my family into uh, to Denmark and England. So I might actually be coming back to Europe uh, in October or November this year as well. And, you know, it'll be a family trip, but we, I always mix business and pleasure together. So if I'm in uh, Europe, I'll have to come and look you up and uh, see what's going yes. on uh, over there. I highly recommend right now you come to Spain. Spain is where, come to Barcelona or come down to Huelva down in Andalusia. The 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 cultivars that are, that are coming out of there right now are mind-blowing they're they're just they remind me of, of american buds and now they're getting way more creative and you know they're curing the buds properly now and that just everything is blowing up down here right now and i would love to show you around there's some Sounds amazing wonderful. lounges and clubs down there i have a brother in valencia and so i go to see him every couple of years and uh so yeah if, Perfect. I, can, if I can make it over to europe going to spain and trying some of that new spanish bud sounds pretty good to me Outstanding. Okay. Thank you again, my friend. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Keep up the good fight. Back at you. Thanks for having me on. And hopefully we talk again soon. Take care for now. What a great interview that was. I don't know about you guys, but I feel like I just went to Dana Larson University. Dude, I learned so many new things today. That was fantastic. Anyway, thanks for coming by, guys. And we'll see you next weekend for a brand new episode of Lake and Bake with Captain Hooter. It's Captain Hooter!